Everybody at some time in their lives asks themselves, who made me? Dr. Lawrence Brown from the USA. Let's talk about people are excited, because you mentioned the word excited. I'm sure they're excited to hear how you came to Islam. Talk about this, talk about your past religious experiences and what led you to Islam. Sure. Uh, actually, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of a fun topic for me, um, because most people assume that I was Christian before I became Muslim. Mm -hmm. And I have to correct them. I have to tell them no. Um, I, I was trying very hard to be a Christian. I had tried for many years to be a Christian in many different ways, and it just never worked out for me. And I get a lot of funny looks when I say that. Um, but the, the bottom line is that what happened was that uh, I started on a, a spiritual search uh, about 19 years ago. I had a daughter who was born with, a, uh, with what, what's called a coarctation of the aorta. It's a, uh, it's a lethal problem, meaning that a child born with this condition most often dies. And they, they usually die in a particularly bad way, meaning that they have open heart surgery and then a few years later they repeat the open heart surgery and then a few years later they repeat it. As the child is growing, they have to increase the size of the graft. And in the end, these children die. So this was the first time when I got the news uh, of her condition. This is the first time in my life I felt I had no control. I, I couldn't do anything about this situation. Oh, every time before in my life when there was a problem, I dealt with it on my own. If I needed more money, I worked harder. If this needed fixing, I found somebody or I fixed it myself, etc., etc. And everybody knows what I'm talking about. When this baby was born, her name was Hannah, she went straight to the intensive care unit. Her body from here down was almost the color of my suit, closer to the color of your suit, just kind of a, a dusky gunmetal blue because her body was not getting oxygen. Her body was literally starving in front of our eyes, uh, oxygen starved in front of our eyes. And, and that part of her body was, was literally dying. And uh, when I saw that, like I said, it was the first time in my life that I needed to turn to some uh, greater power. Um, I was atheist up until then. I had been raised in a family that was basically Quaker, one of the Protestant sects, but not practicing. And I myself had never taken on any religion. So I had to leave the intensive care unit because they brought in a team of doctors, a team of specialists in the field. And uh, while they were doing their thing, I just went to the prayer room and for the first time in my life, I really prayed. And I prayed kind of the typical atheist prayer. There's a, there's a prayer called the prayer of the skeptic. The prayer of the skeptic goes like this. Oh God, if there is a God, save my soul. If I have a soul. Yeah. Okay, that's the prayer of the skeptic. Uh, and most atheists, when they pray, they pray in this way. They say, oh God, if you are there. You know, because they're not quite sure. And uh, that's basically what I prayed. I just said, oh God, if you're there. I don't know if you're there or not. But if you are, I need help. And uh, I made a promise to my Creator on that day. I promised that if He would save the life of my child and then guide me to the religion that was most pleasing to Him, uh, that I would follow. And that was the, that was the simple promise. And, I, and uh, I was only away for maybe about 15 minutes, 15 or 20 minutes. But when I went back into the intensive care unit, my daughter was on the other side of, of the intensive care unit. And when I entered the door and looked across the room, the doctors raised their faces from my, from my daughter. And I could see right away something had changed. Uh, their faces were mystified, as if they didn't really understand what was going on. 
maybe a little bit shocked. Uh, when, uh, when I walked up to them, they simply told me that she was going to be okay and um, that she wouldn't, uh, you know, she wouldn't die. And uh, sure enough, she went back to being a completely normal child in all respects. I mean, you know, normal quirks, but, but completely healthy. She didn't have surgery. She didn't need medication. Um, just uh, her condition completely reversed. And here's the thing. We had, we had an ultrasound film of her heart beforehand. And we had an ultrasound film of her heart after. And before, she had the problem I told you about. After, it was completely gone, stone cold normal. And the doctors, I remember the doctors sort of went through an explanation, trying to make sense of it to me, trying to make sense of it to themselves. And I feel that they bought that explanation, but I remember standing there looking at them just thinking, you know, I know that explanation works for you, but it just doesn't work for me. I mean, that's, I mean, I pray, prayed this prayer. And I just have to believe that this was the hand of my creator. So I knew he had made good on his promise, and I had to make good on mine. So that started me on a religious search. And uh, I was, I thought I would find the truth in Christianity. I studied Judaism first. That led me to studying Christianity. I thought I'd find the truth there for years, years. I tried to convince myself I tried to become Christian. I mean, I went to Seventh-day Adventist, Mormon, Quaker, Southern Baptist, Roman Catholic, Greek Orthodox. I, I don't know exactly how many different uh, sects, how many different churches I went to trying to find the truth of Christianity. And I always kept coming up against the same thing. I always kept liking some part of it, but having trouble with others. And when it came down to the tenets of faith, I would talk to the priests and I would say, well, how about this? And they couldn't explain it. And how about that? And they couldn't explain that. And well, what about this? And they'd kind of shrug their shoulders. And I'd just say, well, you know, thanks anyway, and move on to the next congregation. Um, it wasn't until I found Islam that all of my questions were answered. And it wasn't until I found Islam that peace entered my heart and I realized that this was where all of the pieces of the puzzle uh, came together. What were some of these, I'm sure the viewers want to know, what were some of these questions that you had that weren't, uh, they weren't able to answer when you were going to some of these higher-ups in the uh, church? Well, you'll find, you'll find these as central themes in my books. Uh, but the simplest ones were... Uh, were simply that I didn't find foundation to the tenets of faith, okay? I, for, for example, uh, the Trinity. Uh, it is not mentioned anywhere in the Bible. You, nowhere do you find the word Trinity. Um, it was a doctrine that was derived 300 years after the time of Jesus. And in my simple mind, I just thought, well, if this were a true doctrine, you would have thought that Jesus Christ would have spoken about it explicitly. So I'd, I would ask for justification. You know, how do the Christians justify uh, the concept of the Trinity? And they would always go to uh, certain passages, you know, where Jesus was quoted as having said, you know, I and the Father are one, or uh, there are three on earth, you know, the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, uh, uh, I, I would say, okay, fine, that's written in the Bible, but here are the arguments that cancel those. You know, for example, the Trinitarian formula, the strongest evidence is, is this quotation about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and that is not written in the original manuscripts. That was a marginal note that was written by a scribe into the, into the margin of one of the manuscripts which was later copied into the, uh, into the scripture. And uh, so I would point this out to priests. And, uh, you know, the frustrating thing is I would talk to them and they would finish the sentence for me. I, I would say, this thing that you just told me, it's not in the scripture. It was a margin, and they would say, a marginal note added by a scribe. Yeah, okay, we know that. Okay, uh, well, the next point is, and I'd be thinking, subhanAllah, 
if you know this is not the Bible, if you know that it's an insertion, an illegitimate insertion, why are you preaching it as if it's gospel truth? Um, there are many instances like this, and you can read about this in my books, but one of, the, one of the biggest things that disturbed me was that I believed in Jesus Christ as a man and as a prophet. So I would ask them, prove to me where Jesus Christ is God, or even a son of God. Mm -hmm. And again, we would, we would go through that explanation. They would, uh, they would say their piece, and I would say, look, 88 times in the Bible, 88 times, Jesus Christ calls himself the Son of Man. Yes. Nowhere does he call himself the Son of God. Nowhere. 